Hello, I'm Dave Lubach, the executive editor for the facilities market of Trade Press Media Group. And thank you for joining us with, for today's webcast, From Sunlight to Spotlight, Avoiding Fire Hazards in Your Rooftop Solar Installations. Our presenters today are Chris Chappell and Uncle Songvi. Chris is the Senior Director, Engineering Services for CEA. He's equipped with 35 years of extensive experience in the power generation industry and has installed more than two, two GWs of utility scale PV solar projects and over 250 megawatts of energy storage systems throughout the United States. Uncle is an engineering manager with CEA, and he has more than six years of experience in the PV solar industry. He provides experience in PV cell technology and has a broad scientific understanding of cell, solar cell technology and its manufacturing processes. Today's webcast learning objectives include, one, understanding the most common risks found on solar rooftops, why they happen, and their resulting safety implications. Two, we'll explore case studies and real life examples based on CEA's experience inspecting rooftops of some of the largest retailers in the US. And finally, we'll learn about best practices to rectify safety hazards found on solar rooftops. But before we get started with today's webcast, I'd like to cover a few details about today's event. We do encourage audience questions throughout the webcast. So to submit questions, please navigate to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. Our presenters will answer as many questions as time permits at the end of the present, their presentation. All participants will receive an email within 24 hours with additional handouts from our sponsor. You will also receive a link to a brief online assessment. Upon successful completion of this assessment, you will also receive a CEU certificate. Today's webcast will also be archived at facilitiesnet.com slash webcasts. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Good morning and a good afternoon, everybody, depending upon where you are. Today, we're going to talk about mitigating, you know, operational risks in your PV systems. Again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Senior Director of Engineering Services at CEA. Uh, I've spent most of my career as an EPC building power projects, power plants. Um, so in, in that time, I've installed, you know, roughly two gigawatts of, of solar utility scale and rooftop solar. And um, what scared me most were, were those phone calls I'd get from either my boss or someone at the site. And saying that there was a performance issue on something that just failed. So question I want to ask everybody, and this is a question that you know, we ask a, a lot of our team members, what do you do when you get that call that says something on your roof failed? It failed in service and the system's down and we're losing production. That's one, that's one question. You know, that's one call you're going to get. Or even worse, what if that failure caused a safety risk or put people uh, uh, at risk or the building you know, caught fire? These are two, 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 two issues we, we want to talk about. Go ahead, Uncle. Sorry. So what I just described were two, two operational risks you guys deal with every day. There's, there's a performance risk, and a performance risk is anything that inhibits the production or the output of your solar installation, right? So that's a performance risk. A safety risk is, you know, as it says here, a danger to person's property or the environment. So the picture there on the right is the safety risk. So let's talk about the performance risk a little bit. You get that call, you know, there's an, an issue on your site or on your rooftop. And what we're looking at is, is when we design these systems, we design them with a degradation curve. The, the curve you see on the bottom there, the, the graph there, the green line at the 100% is saying, on day one, year one, we're gonna produce from here. And over time, over 20, 30 years, the system will degrade. As it degrades, we, 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 we build the site and bank on that degradation. But as we get that call from sites saying, hey, an inverter's down, hey, all the inverters down, I've got, or I've got issues, the system isn't, isn't producing, that degradation that is greater than the planned degradation is lost money. So you're losing revenue. So you're gonna get phone calls on that. 
The issue is we want to handle those performance issues right away so that degradation curve doesn't get any bigger. But what, what can happen is a performance issue that isn't handled in, a, in an adequate amount of time can turn into a safety risk. Conversely, a performance risk that is can also be a safety risk at the same time as well. So what do we do when this happens? You know, so what do we do after an event? And like this picture, if we look under the hood of the car, you've got eight guys looking under the hood of the car to figure out, you know, what, what went wrong? Why did it stop? Did my carburetor go out? Is, is you know, am I not getting the right fuel? That's the same thing you guys are gonna do. Something happens, just, you know, you get an event, you get 20 people get crammed into a, a conference room that fits five, and we're like these guys doing a root cause investigation. But what I really want to talk about today, before we get deep here, is there's two things that are happening here, two things we want to do. Once this event happens, just like the guys here, we're, we're going in and trying to figure out how can we fix this. But there's a, you know, what happened? What could we have done differently? You know, how, how can we keep this from happening again? So the root cause analysis part is, is vitally important. But the second piece we want to do is what I call steps to prevent reoccurrence, STPRs. What could we have done prescriptively before this event to minimize any event on this roof? And um, go ahead, I'll call, sorry. What we're all trying to minimize is this dreaded thermal event on the roof. What we're trying to minimize is that, that that event, you see it happening on the left with the fire, but that fire is actually the outcome of, of the effect, what happened initially. And what we, we see is it's, it's the little things that can create the big issue. The big issue on this, this, this slide here is, you know, the thermal event starts, the fire happens, and now you've got a roof that is completely decimated. On top of being decimated, the damage can go through the membrane of the roof and then into the building. And then on top of that, as they're putting fire out, they're putting water on the building and now you've destroyed inventory. So this is a very big thing. The other thing we're trying to avoid besides the dreaded thermal event is the dreaded wind event. You know, we hear a lot about the thermal events, but we really, guys, we don't want to get that call from my boss and say, hey, Chris, a module flew off the roof, it's landed in uh, Randy's car, and luckily he wasn't there, that's an issue. So the wind is, is just as detrimental as, as the thermal event. And the reason I say this is because here at CEA, we have done so many uh, site safety inspections, and I'll let Uncle jump into this section of it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, to join this webinar. Uh, CEA has uh, inspected around 600 PV systems uh, for safety audits. Uh, and uh, these systems include uh, car pops. These is, this systems include commercial rooftops, uh, utility scale systems, and uh, ground mounts. We have inspected PV systems in around 13 countries. Uh, and uh, what we have found interestingly is 97% of these PV systems have been found with at least one major safety concern. To put this in perspective, that is uh, 582 sites uh, out of approximately 600 that we have inspected. But what's what's more interesting is uh, most of the issues could have been avoided or could have been fixed before the thermal event. I personally have been involved as a PV expert uh, for 13 fire investigations. And what we have real, realized that a lot of these issues are a common sense issues that could have been avoided with proper training or proper communication. You know, I wanna go, can you go back uncle? On this, it, when we look at this slide, I mean, I'm an EPC. This really concerns me. This means that, you know, 582 out of these 600 sites had a 
a single or multiple safe major safety issues. As a builder, as somebody who has put in two gigawatts, this is a frightening thing. One, for your buildings, two, for the industry, because this is not, you know, we've got to get that 97% down a lot less than that. It's got, you know, I was amazed at this. So if, it, if you're seeing this number right now, th these events are happening on your roofs right now. So these things are, you're not, you know, more than likely you're part of that 97%. Anyway, sorry, go ahead, uncle. Thank you. Uh, what we have realized is uh, the system owner uh, hires, a, hires an EPC to build the system. The EPC hires a subcontractor, uh, the subcontractor hires a, another subcontractor, and that subcontractor hires another subcontractor. Unfortunately, people who are actually working at the site do not have any long-term incentive or do not have any long-term benefits to make the sites safe. What we have seen uh, typically on the sites are, uh, th there is a lack of communication uh, be between the site manager or the site owner and the people who are actually working at the site. A lot of times they are not aware on the training uh, th that have been imparted to the technicians who are working on the site. And uh, this can actually lead to safety risks and issues. Most of the times, uh, a lot of times, I would say, we are called uh, after the thermal events happen. But I would like to reiterate that calling us before the thermal event can avoid the thermal event. I, I think I, another issue here is, you know, is, is the quality as you get down that hierarchy, like Uncle said, sub to sub to sub. What you've, you know, I'm not sure, you know, a lot of you may have inherited the systems on your building. A lot of you may be building the systems on your on your facilities. But of, of those that have inherited systems, you may be in a situation where the sub of the sub of the sub actually did the installation. And that's what we really want to talk about today. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, do a, a detailed uh, I would like to do a deep dive into the issues, the common issues that we find on the sites. Uh, we have found uh, some issues like grounding issues, uh, damaged models, issues regarding the connectors, broken connectors, cross mated connectors, connectors not assembled properly, cables on sharp edges, uh, hot spots on modules, and uh, uh, so issues inside the enclosures like water ingress and uh, uh, splices that are not approved. I, I do have some pictures. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and as you know, this list shows, if you look at this, these are the 10 biggest items that we found. But the, as you, if you really look at these, these are not equipment related per se. These all have to do with workmanship of modules, inverter, and racking. We all want to look at the big things. It's the little things of the integrated system because the modules, inverter, and racking are all integrated with wires and components. But these are the, 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 the biggest issues that we see on sites. Yeah, let, let's uh, take a look at some pictures uh, on, on interesting issues. Uh, in, in front of your screen, you see uh, some pictures of the damaged modules. Uh, when I say module, it refers to a uh, solar panel uh, in the layman's language. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the word PV modules. Uh, the picture on the top right that you see uh, is the PV module back sheet. When you flip the PV module, uh, the material uh, on the rear of the module is called as a back sheet. Uh, the pictures that we see on the top right have the torn back sheet, cracked back sheet. There may be some other damage to the back sheet. And what happens when there is a damage to the back sheet? You actually pave the way for the water or the moisture to get inside the PV models and get in contact with solar cells. And a lot of times, it can lead to a thermal event, uh, sim uh, just like the picture that you see on the left. And this can be avoided before uh, commissioning the site by a safety inspection. And uh, th this is a completely avo avo avoidable issue. 
And this can happen due to a variety of reasons. This can happen because of the technicians, uh, the way they carry the module. This can happen due to the shipping damage, or there may be a variety of other reasons that uh, can damage the module. And it, it's interesting to know that back sheet scratch, you can't see it without inspection. You get up on your roof, that roof looks great. You can see the tops of your models, it's clean. The devil is in the details underneath. So that picture on the left where that fire damage is on the top, that's from back sheet scratches. That was mishandling and, and those that could have been avoided by pulling those modules with the scratches, replacing them. And you wouldn't have had the downtime and the damage. I don't know this, this project, that, that damage right there was, you know, a good 40, $50,000 worth of fixing of that. So it, those are the things we want you to look at. The picture on the bottom left is, is just, you know, you, as you're walking your sites, you want to know what that's an arc flash from a, a cell that's misaligned and in, in arcing with the frame. These are things as you walk, you want to look in these anomalies can be picked up and corrected right away. Again, the STPR, what could we have done before? Assess our site. So let's, let's keep going. This is great. Yeah, this, these are some very interesting pictures. Uh, my team was at the site uh, during the module delivery. This picture on the left is uh, from a few years back. Uh, modules were getting delivered while uh, my team was on the site. And uh, we can see the stacks of the model actually tilted. Uh, th think about the damage that models may have gone through with every bump on the road this truck is driving. And, and the picture on the right is it's very interesting. My team was uh, inspecting a site back in 2018. Uh, we realized during inspection that uh, positive side of the lead or the positive side of the cable was easily able to come off. Uh, let, let me step back a little bit. Uh, what you see over here, the black colored box on the right picture is called as a junction box. Uh, when you flip the model, you can see a junction box uh, attached to the back sheet. Uh, and uh, we have uh, positive and negative cables coming out from the junction box. So what my team actually saw was uh, the positive side of the lead can be pulled out just uh, by a simple force of hand. Now, now think about this. Multiple PV modules are connected to each other in a string, and the string goes into the inverter we have around 1500 volts applied and there is a current of 10 to 11 amperes flowing and just imagine the site is operating and this module lid comes off this is going to be the cause for a major thermal event fortunately uh, my team was on the site and the client was super lucky uh, to avert this uh, major incident and this this was actually a ticking time bomb that they were not aware on the site. We, we, we were inspecting a site a uh, couple of weeks back. Uh, this is a story uh, from, from one of my recent sites. Uh, the picture on the top left, you see, uh, we, the client had a crew of 10 people uh, fixing the issues that we had found on the site. When we uh, jumped on the roof, uh, we realized that they were walking on the models, they were kneeling on the models, they were uh, keeping their equipment on the models. And not, not just that, when we go to the trade shows like uh, RE+, Plus, we see uh, model manufacturers uh, marketing and advertising their models uh, by walking on them and showing it to you, look how strong is our module. And uh, what they don't realize that every time they walk on the model, uh, they break the cells. Solar cells are very thin and they are very brittle. The picture on the right, it, it's similar to an X-ray, the, the X-ray of the human body. We, we call it as electroluminescence testing or EL testing. It, it's uh, just, just like X-ray of a human body. When you have fracture or damage to a bone, you go to a doctor, you do the X-ray and you realize and, and you see where, the, where you have uh, the damage. And, and it's, it's exactly similar to the X-ray of the model. This damage, you do not get to see with the naked eye. And that's, that's really important. I mean, in what the first thing I would do here to everybody is 
tell the teams up on your rooftops, do not walk on the modules. Even though you, you just see the footprints in that middle module, which is kind of funny. Look at the EL image. This is basically where this guy's been kneeling and walking. And as though you, and though you can't see any damage, as Uncle said, the X-ray or the EL image shows you all the broken bones. And the issue with the broken bones, they get bigger as time goes on. Those cracks are going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And then you have issues. So we definitely don't want to be climbing on modules. I mean, with this site, I mean, we went up there and we were just shocked. Everybody was just <laughs> kind of laying on modules and um, not a good thing to do. So if anything out of the seminar or webinar today, have your teams not climb on modules. Yeah, because this ties up to my point that we made uh, in, in one of the previous slides where pe people do, people hire subcontractors, they are subcontractors and they actually are not aware on who is working on their sites and what is the training they have. And this is the thing that we see quite often even today on a lot of sites that we inspect. Yeah. So 47 out of 100 sites that CEA has inspected uh, were found to be having uh, damaged modules. 31% of the sites were found to be module hotspots. Uh, a hotspot re refers to a heat signature uh, where a component is overheated uh, more than the specifications as uh, laid out by the manufacturer. Uh, we do we we find out the hotspots using the infrared camera or IR camera. Uh, it, it's uh, I think a lot of uh, us know what an infrared camera is because we have done uh, house inspections and a lot of other electrical inspections uh, using infrared camera. Infrared camera catches the thermal signature of the PV component, and you get to know what is the uh, heat signature of that. Com a component compared to uh, other components under the same loading. So, so the picture on the top right, it's, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, you, you can see the checkered pattern on the module. Uh, that happens uh, due to lightning strike, or uh, that happens due to uh, modules connected in uh, cross polarities or incorrect polarities. The correct remedy to fix this issue is replacing the module and uh, there is no other way to fix this issue. Replace the model, get it done the right way. The picture on the bottom left, you see, uh, we, we, we always think about, uh, we, we as an owners or building managers always think about putting as many solar models as possible on our rooftop to get maximum amount of power. But we don't know that uh, there is geometry uh, playing a role over here on how to design a system and how to, design or racking. And, and a lot of times uh, we see uh, the racking shading, the other rack behind it. Uh, and and uh, when the shading occurs, this may result into a hotspot. The picture on the right, uh, it, it's a thermal event. And, and you see there is, a, uh, th th there is a heat signature on the bottom of the model row due to, uh, potentially due to uh, shading. How, how does this happen? This happens uh, when, Technicians walk on a module. This happens due to hail damage. Uh, this happens uh, due to shipping damage, or that there, there may be multiple internal defects uh, in in the modules. You know, in, in the one on the bottom that Uncle was talking about, the two two bottom pictures there, you see the hot spots on the right caused by the shadows on the left. Now, if if this situation is you know it's limited to this picture. If it's consistent, this is going across the whole site. Every module is underperforming. So you've created a situation or you've inherited a situation where the modules will be underperforming in that situation where they're shaded the whole time and they will get worse. So this is definitely a performance issue that could grow into a safety issue. Yeah. Uh... This is uh, my favorite group of slides over here where we are looking at the connector assembly issues. L let me start with few basics. All the PV modules are connected uh, to each other using connectors. 
and uh, the string of the models then go to either combiner box or inverters. And a lot of times uh, the connections are made using this DC connector. DC connector is a small component uh, that is used for connecting two uh, uh, equipment together. And you probably have this connectors, two connectors per model. So there are thousands and thousands of connectors up on the rooftop. This is one of the most undervalued and un underestimated item for a safety risk. The pick I mean, if you look at the signature on the top, everything is cold and the connectors are hot. And like Uncle said, you have got hundreds, if not thousands of these connectors on your roof. And this to be like those little cracks that he circled there in the hole, water and electricity don't mix, mix. They do, they then you get ground faults and then you get arc faults and then you get failures. Then you heat up and things happen. So I, I, I believe this is one of the, the biggest issues that we see right now. Yeah, Chris, and, and, and a lot of people are still unaware that these connectors have a specific um, manual. They come with very, very specific instructions from manufacturer on how to assemble them. And uh, they do have uh, very specific tools to assemble them. And, and, and a lot of folks in the industry are still not aware of uh, these issues regarding the connectors. The, the pictures at the bottom, you see, we, we have the damage for the cracked connectors, okay? Uh, when, when this is the case, it, it paves way for water to get inside the connectors. And uh, what happens is uh, there is increase in the resistance between the two metal pins that are actually connecting uh, and, and making the final connection. And this causes the connectors to heat up. Now. To, to put it in the perspective when that over here on the picture on the top right, we are seeing that these connectors are at the temperature of 152 degrees Celsius. This is for the equipment that is rated for approximately 90 degrees Celsius, maybe even more or less. But what happens when this equipment is heated up? The plastic starts melting, the molten plastic falls on the roof membrane and this starts a fire. I mean, we had to, we had a client uh, two weeks ago. It was a fixed tilt ground mount on a hillside. Their connectors heated up, they melted. The, it dropped on a dry grass. It didn't burn any of the array, but it, the fire went up the hill, hit a wall right before a residential you know, uh, uh, community. Didn't hit any homes, but it went like that. And it's because of because of you know connectors. What Uncle was saying is these connectors are UL listed. They're UL listed. They come as an assembly, and you can't cross mix parts. But it happens a lot more times than not because the threads are the same. But it's something that is we look deeply at these on every site. You know, we 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 look at every single one. Go ahead, Uncle. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the cross mating is an important word. Uh, we, we are seeing issues regarding the connectors like uh, improper assembly, broken connectors, uh, cross-mated or mismatched connectors. Mismatched connectors refers to a situation where you have positive and negative side of the connector uh, from two different manufacturers. This is a big no-no. In industry, there is a popular word called as MC4 compatible. Which, which actually, it's, it's, it's funny. And, and compatibility means the plastics fit. Compatibility doesn't refer to matability and long-term usage of these connectors. These connectors, if they are mated from two different manufacturers, they are not tested. And the UL listing is not for the testing with two different manufacturers. And we have seen a lot of times uh, connectors burning because of cross meeting. The picture you see above, uh, it, it's not cross mating, but but it's 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 just one of my favorite pictures where we had reported a uh, connector uh, lying in the pool of water, and uh, apparently no one cared to fix this. Uh, we tried hard uh, to get them fixed, but yeah. And then one month later, we receive a call after the when the site is operating that uh, they saw a burnt connector on the site. 
and yeah uh, we for all the sites we inspect we have found 40% of the sites have improperly assembled connectors and 41% of the sites have mismatched connectors yeah it, it, it's interesting to know we when we go out we we have you know there's usually someone out there from the developer the, or the epc or the owner and then when we find connectors we say ask them to in, remediate them and put them reinstall them and what we end up doing is we we make the rec request but we watch this gentleman or, or gal put the put the uh, connector in and on the last site we were at the gentleman was was he was all ready to go and he put him in he did three of them incorrectly and so we had to take he told we had to finally tell him let me let's show you how to do them because all he wanted to do was torque them down as hard as he can and when you over torque them you crack them when you crack them water gets inside when water gets inside everything uncle saying happens so not a good not a good thing yeah yeah we we want to stop this we want to see this percentage is coming down every day every year yeah. This has been one of the major uh, issues that we are used to seeing on the sites and cables on the sharp edges or wires on the sharp edges. This is not just regarding the PV sites, but uh, it, it's, it's rampant in all the electrical connections in the building, a lot of them. The picture on the bottom left, uh, I was a PV expert to support the uh, fire investigation at this site. And the pictures on the bottom left, the cables that you see are 250 KCML cables. Uh, and uh, we saw them uh, on the sharp edge of the conduit. Now, if, if you think about it, th th there is a thermal cycling. The temperature changes every day, every night, and every season. This thermal cycling leads into ex expansion and contraction of the cables. When the cables are on the sharp edges, they rub against these edges and it damages the insulation of the cables and this 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 is a major issue and uh, we we have noticed a lot of thermal events uh, exactly due to this issue now a picture on the top right uh, we, we were investigating uh, we were inspecting a site and this this is another example of uh, where we averted uh, a major major issue on time when we start the investigation, we ask, we ask uh, the owners or the developers to turn off the system completely to make sure that uh, we are safe during the investigation. And then we start uh, opening the enclosures uh, to uh, do a deep dive or uh, as Chris said, uh, looking under the hood of a car. Uh, we, we found that uh, this table on the top right was damaged while pulling the cables during construction. I would say they were just lucky uh, the site was operating and uh, they did not come to know. Uh, I, I do not know exact story uh, what, what happened before, uh, but uh, yeah, we found this and this was a ticking time bomb that we diffused. Yeah, and that picture on the bottom left is, is it was actually a really nice, you know, the, the, the conduit, everything looked really good. But that's a that that's an explosion basically that happened right there. It destroyed all that metal, took everything apart. So, again, cables on sharp edges, you know, sub of a sub, and putting the work in. You've got to look at these things because the little tiny nick could be the next big event. We, we have found uh, this issue on 27% uh, of our sites. To put this in perspective, that's around 27 sites out of 100, every 100 sites we inspect. This happens due to the poor wire management uh, by the technicians who are not qualified. Lack of oversight uh, during uh, the construction period. And when, when O&M team goes on the site, what they do is they fix the issues that are already wrong. They do not inspect the sites for the safety most of the time. And they do not realize that there is something uh, wrong on the site unless, unless it goes wrong. And uh, it, it gets into a situation where there is an emergency.
All right, this is uh, one of the other issues, poor terminations, uh, uh, the string of uh, PV models or solar panels are uh, connected uh, into the inverters. And uh, these are the cables uh, from the string of PV models uh, going into the inverters and terminated into a fuse block over here. If you expand the picture, if you if you lose you look at both the bottom pictures very closely, you can see a copper cable, a copper strand show, showing out of the terminal block. On the right, uh, the picture uh, with the black cable uh, that is labeled as A313N, you can see two cut strands uh, on the cable. And uh, when when this th these cables are not designed to be operated when they have damaged or cut strands. This increases the resistivity and this increases the heat signature. When, when we do the IR uh, picture of these cables, you, you can see an example picture that we have that shows there is one cable that is uh, heated uh, compared to rest of the cable, the one that is in yellow, that is shiny. Uh, in, in brief, uh, what we are trying to say is uh, fires do not suddenly happen. We have, as owners, we have time and we have chance to look at this science and prevent uh, the thermal events from our side. Yeah, so the, 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 the big thing here is think of how many terminations you have on site. Think how many potential failure spots you have. So assessing that and understanding that and having that baseline is important. So again, like connectors, there's a lot of terminations. Yep. Yeah, we, we have found approximately 40% of the sites uh, having poor terminations. And by poor terminations, I mean uh, cut strands, uh, strands that are loose or the cables not torque at all. Uh, just readily coming off the termination. This, this is a major issue. And picture uh, on the top left that you see is a picture after a thermal event uh, due to a poor termination on uh, one of the AC switch box that we have seen over here. Yeah, and a lot of times, and not to forget that a lot of times we have seen them, uh, we have seen technicians using the wrong tools for printing, wrong tools for wire stripping. But even when we point out it's a poor termination, what they do is they take out the cable and they reinsert the cable and they call it good. That's not how it works. When there is a poor termination, the correct way to fix it is take out the cable, cut off the poor terminations, restrip the cable with the correct tools, and uh, re-terminate the cable, re them, and put a torque mark. The entire process needs to be repeated. So th these are some of the issues I'm going to show regarding uh, on, on uh, enclosures and power electronics. Uh, typically, a site inspection takes between two days to three days to four days, uh, depending on the size of your site. If the site is small, we can complete the inspection even in a day. Uh, if, if you are to give me, if you as a building owner or building manager are to give me three hours and ask me, hey, uncle, just go to the site, you've got three hours and uh, do what you have to, uh, to provide me the best value you can. My choice would be to open each enclosure at your site uh, open inverters, open DC combiner boxes, open AC switch boards, open AC combiner panels, and inspect them. That is how I'm going to invest my three hours on your site. Most of the thermal events that I have participated in, uh, the, in, in the investigation, not direct investigation, but supporting the investigation, the issue has uh, originated from the enclosure. And we have inverter poles that go unnoticed. We have uh, water getting inside the enclosures due to the bad gaskets or the conduits or the drilled holes that are not fixed. We have broken or damaged components inside the inverters that are not fixed. We have incorrect fuse sizes and the breaker sizes that can lead to these thermal events. So, I mean, what we've got here is like uncle said, we've done inverter investigations, rapid shutdown devices, combiner boxes, but 
What you see on the bottom left there is an arc flash. It's a release of energy. You guys have power plants on your roof that have this type of energy. That release of energy actually started in the two pictures to the right, but or water or other reasons. But that release, that arc flash, has enough power and energy to basically, it'll take the skin right off your bones. And I've seen it happen. It's very huge. So the top pictures is a result of that. That's all mechanical pieces in there that just got completely obliterated by arc flash. So very, very important water ingress, closing your enclosures properly, but power electronics, you know, like I said, rapid shutdown devices, we're doing a lot of thermal event investigation on them, I inverters as well. So that release of energy is on your roof. We want to stay away from that. So that's why uncle said, if you gave me three hours to focus on what I would focus on first, it would be here because there's more potential here. Absolutely, Chris. I, I would like to highlight one of the pictures over here that shows the temperature of 160 degrees Celsius. Th this picture is uh, where we have found, we found a loose screw that were not taut. And this created a high resistance path for the current to flow. And you can see th this equipment is rated for 75 degrees C or 90 degrees C. And the temperature uh, rating that we are seeing is rated for 100 and uh, the temperature that we are seeing on this equipment is 160 degrees Celsius. You know, I want to, uh, what, what uncle's saying there was really important. I don't know if you caught it. A loose screw, a loose screw out of thousands and thousands of screws. That's the due diligence you need to do to do that step to prevent reoccurrence is to get a baseline of those loose screws because that's huge. Yeah, and it is to add to that, Apart from loose screws, we I, I, I have I have seen uh, the technicians on site stripping of the wires in in right above the th terminal blocks. When they strip of the wires right above the terminal blocks, there are small copper strands that go inside the terminal blocks, and we have seen a thermal event occurring from a small copper strand that went inside a thermal uh, terminal block. Uh, simple things like okay, uh, the best practices things like yep. Yeah, uh, don't, don't strip your cables right over the terminal blocks. It, it's important. It's important. You may not notice uh, the effects or the issues uh, right when you are doing the work, but yeah, it can cause into a major fire. I, I love this picture. Uh, uh, I, I always learned in my school days that uh, lower temperature can increase the conductivity. Looks like this guy took it to the next level. Let me tell you, yeah, th this picture is for fun. Uh, th this picture is not from one of my sites or I have not seen the actual uh, combiner box with ice in it, similar to this. This picture was emailed to me by one of my friends a few years back. Uh, and, and I just love this picture. This is the funniest picture. I, did, I do not have good pictures with water. It, it's, it's difficult to capture in camera. So yeah, the water intrusion is the highlight over here. Well, the we funny thing with this uncle is you now can quantify the water because it's frozen. And they, they, <laughs> the cause is the basically the, 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 the not uh, adequately sealed enclosure and it just filled up with water. I think it's, it's phenomenally funny, but tragic. That's true, Chris. That's true. true. And, and some of the reasons for the water intrusions are one of the picture is on the left, uh, where we have a loose conduit fitting. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, this loose, my bad. Let me go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the picture on the left that uh, you are seeing is, is very visible. Uh, a lot of times this loose conduit fittings are not clearly visible. And uh, this has been a major issue for water intrusion. Uh, uh, yeah, a few more points to add to this. Uh, uh, we, we, when we go to the site, we always uh, recommend uh, the conduits to be filled up uh, and sealed off with appro appropriate and listed sealant. And uh, the question we always get back is, show me the code, show me the NEC code. I, my response is, 
Yes, un unless the conduits are coming from a different temperature area to another temperature area for which there is a code. A lot of times uh, we recommend this as a best practice. No seal is a perfect seal and it doesn't take a lot of time and a lot of money to seal the conduits. It's, it's a very simple job that can be done before commissioning the site. This is the picture of uh, the splices that we found in a pool box. Uh, th this was one of uh, the big box stores that we inspected. The picture on the right, uh, you see uh, the, the cables are connected using the splices and uh, the cables have a tape on them. When we went to this site, we asked the technician supporting our inspection to take off the tapes and unwrap the tapes. And we found that the cables, and they have more, we found that they there were actually more splices than that were visible. And there were burn marks on this splices. This, this splices are not recommended. If they have to happen, they need to undergo a approval process, a proper approval process. A lot of these decisions are made on the site uh, by a technician or an electrician. And for this specific scenario, no one knew the splices existed in this box. No one knew there was something bad going on in this box. Lucky, luckily, we found this before it can turn into a major incident. So uh, the brief of uh, the previous slides, we have found 26% of the sites, uh, that is 26 out of 100 sites, were found having uh, water ingress into the enclosures. Enclosures can be AC communal panels or inverters, and it, the water intrusion can be due to wrong, bad gasket, damaged gasket, uh, a screw missing over the enclosure. Uh, we, yeah, we, we, we had a site that, that was just missing a screw over the enclosure and uh, poor workmanship. These are some of the examples of um, mechanical installation issues. Uh, I, I inspected this site earlier this year on, on the left. Uh, we had uh, inspected this site and reported some major issues regarding the racking. There were anchor points missing. There were ballast blocks not placed as per the design recommendations uh, from the uh, UR or the structural engineer. And a year and a half, uh, we get a call uh, that there was a wind event. Apparently, one of the module flew up from the roof and it landed, uh, and it landed right on the zebra crossing uh, from one feet uh, from from. Uh, uh, a lady that was walking uh, and she was very, very lucky that this model did not land on her. Yeah. So another thing that happens on the ballast blocks is we've seen on the roof that the ballast blocks are taken off by people and they're used to hold down other things on the roof. And that's definitely a no-no because that's an engineered ballast block with weight based on wind load. So, um, Okay, let's keep going. I'll go over, want to get some questions, but let's keep going. Absolutely. So to summarize this one, we have found 4% of the sites having issues with mechanical installation. Now, 4% uh, sounds very low, but uh, let me tell you, most of the sites having issues with mechanical installation, poor workmanship, uh, no torquing process, uh, they are ignored during operations and maintenance, and most of these sites are uh, most of these sites have uh, some kind of issues uh, due to the wind event. Our industry, uh, to, I want to leave you all with a thought. Our industry is growing every year. We are rapidly expanding, and it's good. Uh, from uh, 2023 to 2028, uh, it's, it's, it's expected to grow from around uh, 28 gigawatt DC capacity to 
around 50 gigawatt DC capacity with rapid expansion uh, goes down the pallet. And there are many new players uh, entering the market every day uh, and uh, jumping onto this business. I want to reiterate that PV systems are safe if done right. Right. So, you know, kind of closing out, you know, we, we wanted to talk about mitigating risk, performance risks and safety risks. The issue is 97% of the sites have these risks. So what we're recommending your, your teams do is, is do that deep dive on the baseline. What, what can we do to prevent this from happening again? It's get an assessment of what you have. Not knowing what you have, not knowing that you, you know, if you know all your terminations are good, you know everything's, at least you've inspected it, you know they're good or they're bad, and you could, you, you, you know, and you can make decisions based on that. Uncle and I totally appreciate everybody's time, and I, I wanted to get to questions because I'm sure there's a lot of questions, but thank you all very, very, very much for attending. All right. Well, Chris and Ankal, thank you for the presentation. And we do have some questions here from the audience. Uh, first one that I have is um, regarding connectors. Are there types of DC connectors that are recommended or not recommended? What what would your suggestions be? Uh, could you please rephrase the question, Dave? Sure. Um, just a type of uh, connectors. Uh, is there a type of DC connector that you would recommend or you wouldn't recommend? Uh, all, all I would say is uh, whatever DC connectors you use, please follow uh, manufacturer's manual very closely. Uh, please make sure that your team uh, is using the right tools uh, while assembling the connectors. And most of all, foremost, please use the connectors from the same manufacturer for male and female. A lot of times we use RSD devices that come with the, their own connectors. Please make sure that the connectors in the rapid shutdown devices or optimizers or micro inverters are exactly same as the models and your team is using exactly same connectors on the DC home runs. Okay, another question here, I'm asking what are what your experiences are with root cause analysis for manufacturing defects, uh, examples like rapid shutdown devices and, and such. We are, we are performing uh, root cause analysis on thermal events on inverters right now, rapid shutdown devices, racking systems. We have the capability, we have a lab, we have labs uh, that can test components. So we are, some of the components you saw there in our presentation, you know, we do the investigation in the field, deliver it to the lab and they do the destructive testing and the, the, the detailed root cause analysis in addition to what we found in the field. So we're doing quite a bit of those right now. Okay. Um, another question here about shading and how, how does shading cause hotspots? So uh, th th think about the flow of the electrons when the module is shaded, uh, you are actually stopping the flow of the electrons. And if the module is shaded over time, it can create a hotspot, a simple way to check uh, is take a piece of paper, cover a solar cell uh, for a module and check the temperature using the IR gun uh, with, with your IR camera. And you will see uh, the cell operating at a much higher uh, temperature than other cells. Okay, we have one question regarding um, installers. And if um, somebody's looking for an installer, should they be looking for any certifications or maybe what what kind of what kind of aspects or what kind of things should should they be looking at when they're searching for an installer? It, it's it, that's a great question because there's a this this is deep because what you want to do is control your installers with design. You know, installers. You know, you can get a big EPC and you, people who are very qualified, but you guys all have very specific projects with very specific needs. And in there, in your notes and your design drawings, you want to tell everyone this: these type of connectors are acceptable. Cross mating is not, and you define that. And then you meet with that EPC and you you reiterate. You know, do you understand? The other question is: Are you using your own crews? Are you using your own crews? Are you going to sub out to others? And that's what we typically find out. So, 
what I would ask first is, are you gonna sub your work out? Another question regarding lightning. Um, are there any concerns about lightning strikes to rooftop PV systems? Uh, we, we, we have seen uh, some effects due to the lightning strikes. One of the pictures that I show that had the checkered pattern over the models, uh, we have seen some issues due to the lightning strike, but that rooftop didn't have the lightning conductor or, or it was broken. Uh, but uh, yeah, there have been times, but the cases are rare uh, that we have seen the issues due to lightning strikes. Um, another question asking about infrared scans um, and the regularity and frequency of those. How, how often do you recommend um, infrared scans? Uh, higher the frequency, better, but uh, typically during normal o operations and maintenance schedule, we recommend that infrared scans uh, are done for the PV models, uh, at, at least a sample of the PV models on your site and 100% uh, of the enclosures every six months. Uh, another question here regarding uh, connectors. Um, how are some ways to inspect all of your connectors on site? Yeah, uh, one of the best ways to inspect the connectors uh, without touching them is to uh, compare the connectors and uh, see the inconsistencies within the connectors. Yeah, th there are some obvious uh, reasons when you can say that yeah, the connector is bad, it fails. If you see a broken connector, if you see a small crack in your connector, yeah, that connector fails. Uh, now there are some issues like uh, magnet torquing. Let me go back to one of the pictures over here. Yep, uh, uh, take a look at the picture on the top. Uh, the end part of the connector is called as a magnet of the connector. It has a specific torque value. Those are the uh, issues that are difficult to identify. So what CA does is uh, uh, CA compares the connectors installed at the same time and uh, points the inconsistencies out uh, on, the, on the backwards. And we ask the technicians while on the site uh, to describe the procedure to us uh, and uh, do the visual inspection of the connectors and uh, determine uh, if, if they are, uh, if they use the right tools, if they did it the right way, the procedure was right or wrong. And there are at least a couple of threads being shown on the connectors. It's not completely loose. Uh, and and those, those are some of the indications uh, for the connectors. Yeah, and uh, different manufacturers may have different specifications. So please uh, take a look at the manuals. Okay. Um, question about um, authorities to shutting systems down. So if you have a, do users have the authority to shut a system down if, if it's found to be unsafe? And if so, how, how can that be done safely? Uh, we do not shut the system down ourselves unless I'm on the site and I see a fire happening right in front of me. As, as soon as we have, we see a major issue on the site and depending on what type of issue it is, we go back to the client or uh, recommend the EPC to shut down the system. And we have a specific process. So we have made a standard operating procedure to shut down the system. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions here. So we're getting near the end of the hour, but um, one, of our, one of our viewers was wondering about thoughts on testing utilizing thermal imaging cameras um, in comparison to IV curve tracing. Uh, yes, uh, so, so th th that's a really good question. Usually the way I would recommend is, yeah, thermal camera points out to an issue. Sometimes you get the definite issue, but if it's a warranty issue, uh, you can club thermal cameras uh, with the IV curve tracing. Uh, for example, if you are four megawatt site on the rooftop, uh, do 100% of the IR testing through thermal cameras, depending on what uh, you see uh, from your results. Select few strings or few models, uh, depends on what the scope of work is. Select few strings or few models, do the IV curve tracing. And then uh, depending upon the results on the IV curve tracing, you can do the electroluminescence testing. And yeah, CA has clients, uh, ha has helped clients on the, uh, warranty enforcement uh, using uh, electroluminescence testing. A uh, question here regarding rapid shutdowns. Are rapid shutdown switches, are they a must on PV installation? Uh, 
They are a must. There's two, there's uh, NEC 930.12 makes the requirement for rapid shutdown devices. Um, UL 3471, if you put the inverter close in towards the array, you don't need to, to use the rapid shutdown device. The RSD is an issue because it was put in place to protect first responders, but in essence, it's having issues with thermal events It's on its own. So the code has created an issue for us to all deal with. A uh, question about training. What, what do you recommend beyond installer training for decreasing the amount of cables on sharp edges? And is there a way to mandate uh, fewer sharp edges on systems? Uh, one of the ways to do uh, is, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there are a list of uh, trainings that I would recommend. I have three points in my mind. Uh, first thing is, uh, while the site is being built, it's, it's recommended to have the inspection done in the initial stage when they are just uh, completed with 10 or 15% of the area. Uh, in the industry language, we call this as a golden row. Uh, so we are called uh, onto the site when the golden row is completed and we pick out the issues so that they do not get uh, copied onto the other part of the system. Uh, then, then, then the second part of the training is, uh, yes, uh, there needs to be a training on uh, with the technicians on uh, how to route the cables. Uh, that also comes to the design part uh, uh, where we already have it in the designs very detailed that, okay, this is the cable and this is how it should be routed using the uh, specific uh, wire clips uh, on, on, the, on the site. And of course, if you are looking for the official training, it always helps to have the NAPSAP uh, certified installers on the site. Okay. Um, let's see, we'll have two more questions here and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up. Um, first off, would you recommend adding uh, an infrared camera check of installation as part of specifications? Uh, yeah, we, we follow uh, NETA standards for infrared check, if that is the question. Okay. And finally, I guess, any thoughts on technologies like optimizers that'll detect, react, and isolate any, many of the faults and alert o &M teams before hazards occur? Yeah, I mean, go ahead, Uncle. Go, go ahead, Chris. I mean, so... Um, in place of, I've used optimizers a lot in places where I don't want to use a certain other components. Um, have issues with maybe some of the, how do I say this properly? With some of the product coming out that works sufficiently, but I'd rather use the optimizer than have the issue associated with the RST. And I guess one last question here. We've had a great response here with questions and we thank everyone. Unfortunately, we can't get to everything, but last one was uh, any recommendations for animal guards for animal bites on cables? Yeah, uh -huh. I, I, I have a really interesting story on the an animal bites. Uh, one of my clients had uh, animal grazings uh, on their side and every time there was a loud sound, uh, it was right beside the road. Any anytime there was a loud sound or a loud thud or a lightning strike, the animals would start running across the PV models and they actually broke some of the PV models. Yeah, uh, what, what I would recommend is to have uh, the cables in conduits as much as possible, use the split looms uh, to avoid, uh, to, to protect your cables from the animal bites. But yes, they, they can get through uh, the split looms uh, at some time. And it's, it's necessary to audit and inspect the site. Okay, well, that, that's, that wraps up our uh, discussion and webinar today. We thank everybody for joining. We had some great questions. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to those, to everything, but uh, thanks again to Chris and Anko for joining us today. It was a great presentation and hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dave.